Mira. Oh, there we are. Okay. Good morning. My name is Sarah Fossils. I serve as a board administrator for the Texas State Board of Social Worker Examiners. I'll make a roll call. Uh, Chair Brumley. Present. Ms. Andrade. Present. Ms. Graham said she could not attend. Ms. Morris. Present. Ms. Morris. Thank you. Ms. Mosher. Present. Ms. Romsbacher. Present. Ms. Rogers. Present. Thank you. Ms. Sainz Davila. Present. And Ms. Swartz. Present. Thank you. We have uh, met the quorum. I'll turn it over to Chair Bromley. All right. So we have called the meeting to order. It is 831. So our first um, action here is um, item number two now, board review and possible action, action regarding appeals of application for licensure denials, including Alicia Barron's, Lazia Cantu Ramos, Brian Crawford, uh, Aurelio De La Fuente, Nancy Heron, uh, Emilio Herrera, Michael Johnson, Donnie Jones, Shem Shamika Jones, Rebecca Kern, uh, Amelia Rivera, Julia Trogel, Kate Walsh, and Yolanda Williams. Good morning, appellants. I'll, um, I'll reiterate some of the information that I've sent to you just so that um, those who are in attendance who are not appellants also know. Um, most of the appellants on the agenda today are uh, appealing the five-year rule. That's the uh, 781-406-C as in Charlie three that states that supervised clinical supervision must have taken place uh, no more than five years before the application is received. The attorneys have opined that the board cannot act until that rule has been repealed. Um, the board is on the agenda today for the board to consider the adoption of repeal of that rule and it is tentatively scheduled for the council to review that rule on October 25th. Um, so, but, but these appellants do have a right to speak to the board. Um, there may be some issue in their, in their case that staff did not see that the board members who've received their materials have seen. So these appellants are here uh, in case the board members have any questions um, or if, if there's some action that can be taken. So with that, I'm going to get back to the appellants. And for my ease, I'll take them in uh, alphabetical order. So Alicia Barons, I see that you have that you have logged on. Can you unmute? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. So the, okay. Good morning. The board members have received all the materials in your file. Is there anything you'd like to add at this time? Um, I went back and forth uh, whether or not I wanted to write a long drawn out plea as to why I should be granted a license that I worked really hard for and rightfully earn. I'm not going to beat a dead horse whether or not um, explaining my situation when I know that you, uh, the board already has my appeal. I listened to the July 8th hearing and heard heartfelt statements that came from fellow colleagues uh, that presented during the hearing for the hearing to only end with no resolution. Now we are in October and it's something that um, is near and dear to my heart and it's really affecting me that this it's come to this and still no resolution. Um, so instead of me um, just going ahead and beating a dead horse, I'll just wait and see what the board has to say. 
at the end of this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Barrons. Thank you. Any questions from the board members? So Sarah, as we as we move forward to go into these, um, Miss, who was first? Miss Barrons. Miss Barrons. Yes. Uh -huh. um, just just so you and everybody under, understands where we are today with this, um, we have a. Um, this board has moved forward with the process of mm -hmm. eliminating the issue. It now has to go forward to our, I'll call it our parent board, BHEC, <laughs> the Behavioral Health Executive Commission. That, that meeting will be held on October 25th. At that meeting, um, there will be a vote related to this topic for BHEC to move this issue into a change of rule. So when that happens, then we can consider action moving forward. Does that, does that help explain what's going on? Um, yes, I mean, I, I understand that it's a uh, process. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I do understand that. Okay. Um, I just wanted you to understand that that, that um, on October 25th will be the the point of action that will move this forward. Okay. Okay. Didn't mean to interrupt. No, Sarah. that's okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, if there are no questions, um, and, and no questions about any other grounds that might allow the board to act at this time on Ms. Barron's case. Okay, then I'll move forward to, thank you, Ms. Barron's. I appreciate you being here today. Um, I will keep you informed along with all the appellants um, as to the board's actions today and um, as to the council's actions on October 25th. Thank you. And you'll receive that in email, <clears throat> email, like I've been sending the updates. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Cantu. May Isaac Cantu, are you able to unmute and would you like to address the board? Uh, yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, am I on? I sound like I'm on speaker. Um, <laughs> good morning. I just, um, I agree with the other person. Um, I can, can say for myself that I submitted my information, um, my verification, everything in 2018. Um, it just took me a while to pass my test. Um, but I, but I did pass it. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, I deserve the credentials. I studied very hard for them. And, and, and you know, if I want to move forward in another position, I need those credentials. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that, that was any, everything that I wanted to say that for the board to consider those people that you know they work so hard um, that they turned they submitted everything um, their information was submitted back when um, it was a different department uh, and now moved to to behavioral executive council so i can speak to um the uh many people got caught in that they submitted their application back when we were with HHSC. And at that time, you submitted your application, staffed work, looked at your supervised experience. And if your supervised experience uh, satisfied rules, then they would allow you to sit for the exam. Shortly after moving to the council, uh, the council contracted with ASWB to process our exam eligibility um, requests and 
ASWB was, was not specifically looking at all of the Texas rules for licensure. So if you attested that you've completed your supervised experience, because of course you had, um, they did not check whether the supervised experience was completed in less than five years from your application date because they don't have the date in the future that you were gonna apply because you had to pass your exam before you could apply. So that was on staff to look at the five-year part. And that caused a lot of confusion. The trigger date is not when you first submitted your first application to reclassify as a as a LCSW, it's, it's your most recent application. And an application is only good for a year. And those rules have been in place for quite a long time, uh, more, than, more than five or six years. So, but it is confusing, but it's a moving five-year window triggered on your most recent active application for the LCSW. None of that makes it any harder to take because I understand how hard you've studied and how hard you've worked toward this credential. But I just wanted you to understand we're, we're, we are following the rules that are in place. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board members? I don't have any. And do the board members or the or attorneys see any grounds for moving forward on this particular case? Uh, after October 25th, I do. Yeah. Okay. So Ms. Cantu, I, again, with all the appellants, I will send you um, uh, an email summarizing what's happened today. And um, I will keep you informed as to the council's actions on October 25th. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Next on the list is Brian Crawford. There he is. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. <clears throat> yes, I, this is me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you for hearing this case. Um, it's, just like the other two, it sounds like nothing can be done until October 25th. Um, the reason for the length of time for me is that it took me five times to pass my LCSW exam. Um, but I did tirelessly study for the exam and uh, it just was a hard test for me to pass. Uh, and. Um, uh, but uh, I'm glad that I'm not the only one dealing with this, or at least that gives me some comfort. Um, and uh, I just hope that everything goes through so that all the work that I did put into getting this upgraded license uh, can count for something uh, because I did spend many years trying to achieve this goal of mine. And I'm sure the other applicants or appellants did also. That's really all I have to addition of what I put in my appeal. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Crawford? I don't have any. Okay. Then, thank you, Mr. Crawford. Uh, we'll move on to the next case. Mr. De La Fuenta, uh, send his regrets. He uh, works with the Veterans Affairs and had a visit from, is planning a visit with the U.S. Secretary of Veterans Affairs at his establishment today. So he sent his regrets. It's in your board materials. Um, do you have any questions about his case? He is a military uh, veteran. I saw no grounds under the military rules that would help him at this point but I defer to the board members and to the attorney if you see anything that I might've missed. I did not see anything, Sarah, that would, would alleviate the issue other than our current plan. Okay. So I'll move if, on. If he were here now, 
I would sincerely thank him for his service, both in the battlefield and the essential work that he's doing now. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Okay. The next one is Nancy Heron. And I, I do see some people that have called that have called in by a phone number and I can't see your name. So if you're an appellant and I've passed over you because I don't see you, I'll come back to those that have called in in just a few minutes. Looks like this might be Nancy Heron. Ms. Heron, are you there? Is this? Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I've been playing around with my screen because it's not giving me an unmute thing. And so something happened just now. So I'm glad that happened. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this time. I just, I don't have anything other to say. Um, I did um, send in several letters over the, before I even set for my license. Um, and never got a response, which was very concerning to me about a couple of questions I had regarding that. But and since then, um, it's all just wrapped up in um, waiting to see if the five-year rule has, um, what I wanna say, this quit, stopped, so um, revisited, whatever. So anyway, thank you for your time. I know that you do a lot of hard work um, making sure that we get what we need to be good social workers and that was everything is on the up and up and but the situation like everybody else said was at, and is very frustrating in and of itself but again thank you that's all I have. Thank you Ms. Heron. Any questions from Ms. Heron? Uh, I would just like to sincerely thank her for her service also. Thank all you ma'am. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Heron. I'll be sending out um, an email after this meeting. Thank you. Next on the list is Emilio Herrera. I don't see Emilio logged in as a computer applicant, so we'll move on. Um, Michael Johnson. There he is. Mr. Johnson. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'd like to say good morning to the board, uh, to all board members. Uh, thank you all uh, for giving uh, your valuable time to this matter. Uh, I appreciate uh, the empathy that the board has for this issue. I understand that it's not just the social work profession, but other professions have also looked at this five-year rule. And, 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 and I believe it's my understanding that many don't have this five-year rule that would prevent a person that has met criteria under supervision uh, from being upgraded, from upgrading their license such as the case uh, for me. I do uh, understand my responsibilities uh, in this matter. Uh, as you see in my information, uh, I completed my supervision in 2018. And uh, without going into any details, I referenced in my uh, appeal letter, uh, some life events. Uh, difficult for individuals in situations like that when life events happen that impact family to move forward and prioritize uh, this exam process, which is a process uh, preparing for the exam and studying for the exam. It requires a level of focus. Uh, as you all can see, uh, my focus deserved uh, my time and attention in another area outside of this exam. Uh, uh, so I'm humbly uh, asking that the board would take that into consideration uh, understanding that all other criteria for licensure uh, have been met. Uh, as you also see in my material that I currently work under supervision of the, the, uh, of the supervisor who supervised me then. So again, I just like to 
actual consideration uh, in looking at situations like this individually. And, uh, and uh, in my particular case, grant my licensure uh, upgrade uh, from LMSW to LCSW. And thank you for your time again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, also, um, an element of Mr. Johnson's case was uh, not only the five-year rule that the um, supervision, part of the supervision was completed before five years before his application was received, but also there's another rule that states that supervision must be completed be over a time period of at least 24 months, but not more than 48 months. On the supervision verification form that was received um, that was first received in 2019, the supervisor reported a total of 54 months um, from May 1st, 2015 to October 31st of 2019. And later, uh, staff received a a, a verification form signed by the supervisor that reported uh, 33 months with the same total number of hours and the same total number of supervision hours. I've tried to contact Supervisor uh, Jackson, both by mail and by email, and I've been unable to get a response to help me clarify this. So I'd like the board members to look at this and ask you if you will accept the verification form that reports from May 1st of 2015 to January 31st of 2018, a total of 33 months with 100 hours of supervision and 3,960 hours of uh, total, uh, total experience. That's in his packet here isn't it it is in, in his packet, packet. yeah <laughs> which which one is it sarah do you know which i'm um, i don't remember so one of the verifications form is on page 13 of 26 i don't know how it's labeled in your pdfs it it would be like a csv or a verification form I'll try to page three. I could. I, could I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but if I if if I could, uh, I do want to thank uh, Miss Fossholz if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, because I do appreciate you responding to me. It's and I understand the the challenge that the board has in responding to so many applicants. Uh, uh, so it was refreshing to get uh, communication back from you because it it, it has been difficult. Uh, this is the first time that I uh, have been made aware, however, that my supervisor needed to be contacted about a dispute because the only supervision verification form that I'm aware of and signed is the one that shows the 2018 ending date. That's not going to happen here now. So here's the Here's the one that, I'm sorry, it's very faint, but here's the one that shows the 33 months. And here's the one that was signed in 2019 and it shows the 54 months. And- Did they both start uh, May of 15? They both start May 1st, one ends October 31st of 2019. And the first one ends January 31st of 2018. Mr. Johnson, are you aware? I know you just indicated you didn't know there was an issue, but do you remember signing both of, both of these? I do not, uh, which is what I'm concerned about, but if my signature is on it, I'm looking at. The one uh, that's on the screen now is the one with the, the 33 months that ended in 18. 
January of 18. I'm familiar with that one. I remember sitting That's down looking for that one. You're, you're hard to hear right now. I don't know if you're looking or away from the mic. And then the one on the screen now is the 54 months. It could be because the one is signed in 2018 for 33 months. It could be that Mr. Johnson and Supervisor uh, Jackson submitted materials and attempted the exam. And then later, because he'd already satisfied the hours, they might might not have continued to, to track and I mean, certainly they probably tracked logs, but may not have gone to the effort since they knew that that part was already satisfied. Right. They may not have gone to the effort to update it, but it just appears to staff that that inconsistency was submitted and staff is required to bring it to the board. Absolutely. So Sarah, clarify for me here. We have two issues. He, he is under the five year issue. Yes. But now the 48, but, but we can, we can, we're not changing the, we're not asking to change the 48 month rule we are changing it on October 25th as well. Not we? it's it's in the queue, but it's not it's not ready. It's to not go. there yet. Okay. So we today. But can if you if you could accept ac the first one, if you accept the verification that says 33 months, then, then once Johnson, the five year rule is removed, staff can proceed on the 25th. Or, or we can we can vote. We'll vote on the 25th and they'll proceed. Staff thereafter. can proceed there. Okay. Well, I, I will make a, a motion to accept the initial uh, verification form submitted by um, Mr. Johnson, and I believe it was Mr. Jackson. As the uh, supervisor. As the supervisor um, with an ending date of January 31st, 2018. I'll second that. So having a motion and a second, all those in favor of accepting the verification form qualifying Mr. Uh, Johnson for um, approval of the within the 48 month rule, please signify by raising your hand or indicating by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, seeing none, the motion does pass. So Mr. Johnson, um, you'll be now in the same queue as everyone else. You'll be, you'll be waiting on the BHEC meeting for October 25th to see the vote and outcome on the five-year rule. So does that make sense to you? It does, and I appreciate your consideration. Uh, uh, we, Many of my colleagues have talked about uh, uh, the time and the dedication that went into this. Uh, it's important during these financial times, <laughs> these tough financial times, uh, to even appreciate uh, the financial sacrifice that also goes into this. So I strongly appreciate your consideration and uh, thank you for uh, considering the work that I've done. All right. Well, thank you for showing up and speaking to us today. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So I, I do want to apologize. I didn't want to catch, I didn't mean to catch you off guard with this other issue of the 48 months and the, and the conflicting information we received. It, it's the burden of the supervisor to verify your hours. So it's our policy to reach out to the supervisor for that clarification. Um, but I certainly did not mean to, to give you additional alarm and uh, catch you off guard on that. Not a problem. And I do understand the challenges that you all have and, and once again, appreciate the work that you do. Thank you, sir. Next on the agenda is Donnie Jones. I see a D Jones. Donnie Jones, is, if this is you, are you able to unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's D Jones, Donnie Jones. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to express to the board? Um, no, just like with everyone else, I, I did complete the exam within the five year period. Uh, mine was specifically the supervision. I was going into a new position at uh, the place of employment. And so stayed in the supervision just because I, it provided me uh, extra 
just experience and knowledge that I was getting from other um, social workers that was also in the LCSW supervision. And so I just extended my supervision, but I maintained the number of hours as stated in my um, appeal letter. And board members, I'm looking up my notes, but I believe they're, yeah. So I wanted to confer with you again on the 48 month type of issue. Let me share my screen. On the verification form, you can see that the start date is October 10th, 2012, and the end date is November 30th, 2017. That's more than a five-year period, but 37 total months are recorded. My analysis showed that some of the months may not have had full activity. Um, another uh, verification form reported 33 months with the same number of hours. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the wrong line. Um, so there is a supervision log and sorry, Wrong, wrong file. In Ms. Jones' file, there's a supervision log and not counting months with less than two hours. Um, it totals 51 months and not counting months with less than four hours per month, it's 28 months. Um, so I'm not sure how to suss out that information. So Sarah, but both situations do exceed the 48 months. Well, there's, that's kind of, that's kind of, um, I've asked him to uh, just recently to look at the form because staff will look at the beginning, the start date and, end date, yeah. and the end date, and then also look at the total months reported. And it could be that the supervisee took some time off maybe uh, for maternity leave or had um, a disruption in employment. So some of those months, it, it, they may not have worked continuously for those, for those five years, or there might've been some disruption during those five years. So right. the 37 months could be correctly reported. Um, so does our rule- And, and so I'm just- Yeah. I'm, And the, however, the, the rule, the way it's stated is over a period of time from at least 24 months to 48 months. So, and again, that's kind of a moving window. If you don't complete the 3000 hours within the 48 months and you go to the 49th month, well, that means the first month drops off and then you've got to still calculate what happened. Yeah. So, but she has a total of 190 supervised hours too reported. 100 and yeah, and, and almost double the total yeah. hours. So, Miss, uh, it's Miss Jones, right? That's yeah. Yes. Jones, that's yes. So, what? Um, so you did indicate when you were talking first that you 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 changed jobs during this process. No. So I had started a new job at communities and schools and was placed on the campus where I was by myself. So when I started the supervision, I maintained the supervision during the whole time frame and um, just extended that. I didn't like stop, I just continued because that was like the link to other program managers on other campuses that were also um, providing services. And so I just saw it as a benefit to continue and extended my supervision time. Okay. so. Patrick needs to tell us something. He's got his hand up. Please. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I, it sounds like there might be a chunk of time if you just, because you went way over the, the required amounts, you can count a previous amount of time. So possibly just go back to the supervisor and ask them to keep it within that 48 months. I, I imagine, I, I don't know it, but it looks like because she did so many hours, if they fill out the form again, I'm sure they can get it within that time frame and probably have the right amount of hours for it, if, if that makes sense. Do you think that could happen, Ms. Jones? Uh, Chris Downing, I still know where she's at. I can uh, connect, contact her, but I just need to kind of get clarification about exactly what I need to do with the hours because I do. So you I have. Can, so uh, yeah, go ahead. So Ms. Ms. Jones, what I'll do after this meeting is I'll I'll draft a letter to your supervisor. Okay. And uh, explain it all. And um, in case her contact information isn't up to date in our database, I'll also copy you on it. Okay. And then uh, you can get together with your supervisor and and see what you can do. Okay, so she just needs to redo this. We just need to redo the form. Is that what you, you're saying? You need to look at you need to look at your supervised experience. Um, I can't tell you to just fix the form because it has to be truthfully reported and I can't yes. encourage you to make the form look right without looking at the correctly reporting the history. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm trying to be very careful about how I phrase that. Um, but I'll include, I'll include the rule requirements and I'll include the information we received and I'll include um, why we're questioning it. And then you and your supervisor can look at your history and um, and submit a corrected form. Okay. Based on your history. Okay. Okay. And that okay. hopefully that will clear the forty-eight month maximum uh, requirement, um, and and then the five-year chunk will will still have to wait for the October twenty-fifth uh, action by the council. So on that one, I actually did take the test within the five year period. And the and the trigger date is not the test exam date. It's the application for LCSW, the date that yes. the application is received. Yes, I submitted it on in 2017 and they said I had to November 2022, which was would be the five years to complete it. An application is only good for one year if okay. all elements are not satisfied within that year. Okay. And I show that you submitted, I show that you submitted your application for LCSW, the most recent one, the active one on August 8th of 2022, after you passed the clinical exam, which is now the correct process. Pass the exam first and then apply. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, if you can read the note that I, the, my appeal letter, it states that when I went online to the website to um, apply to take the test, it was saying that if you already had an existing application that was prior to the 2020, that you had to like keep that application in place. So uh, I didn't resubmit. Uh, they said that the application that I submitted on 2017 was the one that was in place until that was the standing one until the five year, the 2022. So the, okay. Uh, so there's, there's a rule that's been, again, in place for a decade that an application remains open for one year. Okay. Unless, unless, um, if all requirements are not satisfied within that year, that application is null and void. I do okay. think that you submitted an application in December of 2017, and you submitted one in February of 2018, and one in February of 2019, and then you passed the exam on July 29th of 2022, and then submitted your most recent application in August of 2022. Yes, and I and I I understand where you're coming from because when we when we transitioned, where staff would look at your application first and yes. check all of your qualifications and then allow you to sit for the exam, 
then we transitioned to um, the ASWB processing our exam eligibility requests. There was a there was a a separation of those who applied before that. I'm thinking it was November of 2020. If they already had an active application, one that was less than a year old in November of 2020, they were to proceed with the exam process under that application and continue to get approval for the exam from our staff. But if they had an, an application that was older than a year at November of 2020, then they needed to contact ASWB to sit for the exam. So it may be that staff was trying to tell you, we need to approve your exam part, but that doesn't that that didn't grandfather or keep your application open past that year. It only it only determined what process for exam eligibility you were being segregated into. That's completely confusing. <laughs> but I think the outcome here is that you're on the right track. Okay. At this point. Is and that, and yeah. just with a little more patience and yeah. persistence, we're all looking forward to that October 25th date. Yes. Okay. So, so you'll get an email from Sarah with, with detailed information about the form, the supervision form um, and how you can work to remedy the issue at hand concerning the 48 month rule. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I appreciate your patience. And I'm making myself a note. So bear with me, supervisor. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Can I go ahead and log out? You you may. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Next on the list is Shamika Jones. I don't see her in the attendee list. So I'll move on to the next one. Rebecca Kern. I don't see Ms. Kern on the list. Amelia Rivera. I see someone who signed in as River A2. So River A2, if you're Amelia Rivera, can you unmute? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add um, the same as you know my previous um, colleagues, just uh, with regards to um, work so hard. Um, it took me a while to pass the LCSW, and I am so grateful that I did, and I thank God for that. Um, and also, you know, um, just wanted to thank everyone uh, for your time as well. Um, but just that I worked very hard for this and I really would appreciate if this um, motion would be passed and just um, be considered um, among, you know, all the others as well. And I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. You're welcome. Board members, do you have any questions? I don't have any. Okay. Mr. Rivera, then um, I'll be sending you some correspondence after this meeting and again on the 25th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amelia Trego. Okay. 
I'm sorry, Julie Tragel. There she is. Well, she was just there. Where'd she go? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you all for being here. I Ms. Tregle, you're breaking up quite a bit. Do you have your video on? If you do, you may turn your video off and just talk to us with audio because we you're breaking up like a robot. And it, so I don't know if there's two of you, but it looks like you've muted yourself if again. If there were any questions, I did submit my application on uh, in 2019. I'm sorry, my internet connection is bad. Um, communicate via email. I just wanted to be present in case there are any questions. You're, you're much better now. I can hear you. I just wanted to see if there, uh, hi, good morning. I just wanted to see if there were any questions. Okay, great, sorry about that. I just wanted to thank the board for being here. And um, I, I did submit my application in 2019, but I, the board received it. So I included um, the emails following up on that application. And um, then COVID hit and it was very difficult to communicate with anyone at the board. And then there was the transition to BHEC, um, BHEC. And um, so I, I passed my exam in March and submitted my application shortly after. But um, I'm, I'm here if you have any questions. And I, I thank you in advance for your consideration. Thank you. Board members, any questions? I do not. So Ms. Trogel, I'll send you um, an email after this meeting and again on October 25th. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. Absolutely. Next is Kate Walsh. Ms. Walsh, can you unmute? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Good morning, members of the board. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Um, I, similarly to everyone else who has spoken so far this morning, was caught in a few of the um, intricacies of the changeover, as well as this five-year rule. Um, so as you can see in the paperwork, I had continued my supervision after what I had already submitted. So I'm hopeful that that will remediate the five-year issue. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions as needed. And the reason that it took me five years was because I delivered premature twins during um, the pandemic in May 2020, um, right as I was studying and preparing to take it the first time. So it took me a little bit to get back on track. So she will also be impacted by the October 25th plan. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So does that make, does that, do you understand that what's going on with October 25th, Ms. Walsh? I do. Okay. So we will um, anticipate that taking place and um, Sarah will update you by email. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Thank you. And Yolanda Williams. Can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Do you have any statement for the board? Well, you were there. We lost you, Miss Williams. Try again. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Excellent. Yes, yes. Okay. I would like to thank you all for, for hearing us out. Um, I can identify with, with almost all of, of the, the appellants. And uh, I just um, say that the hard work and dedication that we put in um, deserves to be recognized, regardless if that's five years, 10 years, you know, the work was what we put in the work and uh, it wasn't easy, uh, especially, I'm not gonna get into my letter, but especially involving trauma. I have gone through multiple, multiple, multiple traumas and never stopped pursuing and never stopped persevering. And uh, I did it <laughs> this year. And so I just thank God and I hope that you all recognize the work that we put in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Any questions from the board members for Ms. Williams? Okay. Ms. Williams, I'll be sending you an email about today's meeting and also an email on October 25th uh, at the conclusion of the council's meeting. Thank you. So, Sarah, that was the last one, that unless was... Rebecca Kern, Shamika Jones, or Emilio Herrera are out there in a phone number. So, I see Rebecca Kern. Ms. Kern, can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, sorry, I was, um, I've been watching you all on Zoom, and for some reason it wouldn't let me chime in when it was my turn. Uh, so I frantically dialed you up and here I am. Um, I wanna thank you guys for meeting with us today I'm in the same situation as everybody else. It was um, really almost like group therapy this morning to hear that I'm not the only person that was uh, kind of muddied by the, the rules and the timeline. And, um, you know, I had taken the test twice actually before I passed it this last April and to be honest with you, I failed it by one point, one time and six another. And I almost stopped. I almost just gave up. Um, but last year I switched to probably my dream role as an outpatient oncology social worker. And it really inspired me to get focused, get a better test prep, get my test taken and um, I passed it and so overjoyed. So my heart dropped when, uh, when I found out that I had to do the appeal, but I'm going to continue on and I'll wait for October 25th. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Kern. I appreciate it for your time. Any questions for Ms. Kern? No, I don't have any. Okay. So Ms. Kern, um, I'll be sending you an email after today's meeting and also after the council meeting on October 25th. I do appreciate you being here today. Thank you. So I'm gonna check again for Mr. Herrera and Shamika Jones, I believe was the That other was the other one, yeah. Thank you for keeping track. I don't see. I do have a phone number, so I'm going to ask the phone, the person who called in by phone. Oh, maybe it's gone. And I don't have a phone. I don't see. Okay. Um, so I believe that concludes um, the appellants. I no longer see the phone number on my list. So it looks like that dropped off. Um, and Mr. Johnson, you have a raised hand. Is there something more you'd like to say to the board? Yes, can you all hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah, I was wondering about uh, the council's vote on the 25th. Uh, I didn't hear anyone speak to whether or not there was any uh, reason uh, that might have been proposed uh, against the against accepting your proposal to rescind the five-year rule, uh, which so many people 
uh, hanging on the balance of their decision, just wondering, is there an argument out there that's against it? Uh, I can, I, I hope, let me try to, I'll, I'll try to help you out, Mr. Johnson. So um, I also will be, I will be at that meeting um, representing the social work board. And um, typically when, when a member board of VHEC supports a change, um, there may be some questions about why we're doing this, but typically our support is also supported by the larger council. So I, I do anticipate that it will pass. I do not have any um, kickback from anyone at this point to me saying that this is not a, a plan that should go in place. So hopefully that helps alleviate, alleviate some of your concerns. And I'll ask attorney Patrick or attorney Andrew. Um, so it, I believe in statute that the if the council rejects a board member recommended rule, the council has to provide rationale. The council is to look at the rule in regard to uh, any, what's it called? Uh, Anti-competitive trade yeah. uh, issues. And we don't think this rule will fall under that. The, there's a, Sarah, if, if I can piggyback on that, there's a BHEC rule that talks about whenever a rule is submitted from an uh, underlying board to the underlying board to the council, there are things that it can be reviewed for. And then if if it is sent back, you're correct, they would say, you know, why, why they're sending it back uh, to the board. Um, and uh, there's there's criteria that they'll look at when they review a rule. So it would be, you know, for anti-competitive effects or for good governance, th things like that. It's all spelled out in the rule. Uh, but um, um, I'm not, as we sit right now, I'm not aware of anything right now that, that, the, that the council has against this particular rule. And this rule has been before the council as a proposed rule and was published. So presumably the council would have voiced any of those objections in an er at their earlier review. And Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe we received any comments in, in opposition to this rule change, did we? That's correct. There's been no comment to the contrary. Okay. It's uh, comforting to hear and I certainly appreciate you guys uh, providing that information. Thank, Thank you for you. your question. Excellent. All right. So, Sarah, I believe that can, concludes agenda item number two. Yes, sir. And we will move to agenda item number three, board review and possible action regarding agreed orders to be executed by the board. We have a hand raised from Kate Walsh. Do you want oh, to take that question? I'm sorry. So um, and while I was reading, Kate Walsh raised her hand. We'll go ahead and take Ms. Walsh's question, and then we'll move forward. Ms. Walsh, can you speak? Yes. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. So just to clarify, um, my understanding was that my application was also denied because just the first several months um, or the first three or four months of my initial verification had expired, those supervision hours. And so now I've submitted additional um, continuation, which I completed after that fact. So I just was not sure whether that um, remediates the situation prior to that meeting. I was hopeful that it might. You can see that the um, dates continued. So staff was not able to move forward. The looking, I'm, forgive me, I'm looking back at my notes. Okay. That still would that's still only a nine. That's not at least a 24. But is that the addendum? Is that what she's saying? This is an addition okay. to my original. So let me share this with the, I'm gonna share my notes with the board members so they can all see. Okay. So the original one was 24 months.
So it was 24 within a two year period. 103 hours. And the and then there was the, the delay of. So we, what, we what we don't know is how many hours were accrued before August of 2017, which is the only date we can accept them beyond that date because of the, the date of our application. Oh, so you can so accept. So I, I, we can't do any math from the data we have here to determine what you actually accrued that we can count from the first verification form. Does that make sense to you? Um, so the other hours that I submitted the second verification form, does that not, it's still within the five-year period of when I... So do, if you can see my screen. Yes. The form that was received on December, on September 15th. Yes. It shows nine months and at least 24 are required, at least two years are required. It, it's but it's nine in addition hours. to the 24. Well, it, it could be, but we can't tell, we can't tell from these two forms because your start date of the first one is in April of 2017. We don't know how many supervision hours and how many total hours to, to subtract for the April 2017 to the August 2017 where we can start counting. So let me put this in an email to okay. your supervisor and to yourself okay. uh, with the rules and with what we've received and, and where our conundrum is. And I'll ask for you and your supervisor for clarification. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank I appreciate you, you asking. Okay, sorry about that. No worry. So I, I would like to thank all of the appellants if you're still on the call. Um, thank you very much for attending today. It's important for the board members to hear your experiences and understand um, all, the, all the hard work that you've put in. Um, they know it because um, most of them, uh, uh, six of the board members are professional members and have been through a process similar to yours. Um, but of course with COVID, um, special circumstances have arisen. I do appreciate your patience and your persistence um, in pursuit of your goals. And as we uh, try to change the rules to better adjust to our current circumstances. Thank you. All right, seeing no further hands raised, we will now move to agenda item number three, which is board review and possible action regarding Agreed orders to be executed by the board. And my notes are that there are none. All right. Hearing there are none, we'll move to agenda item four. Board review and possible action regarding contested cases from the State Office of Administrative Hearings, or SOA. I do have an update for you. Uh, the one case encompassing three cases from 2016. Uh, the licensee did voluntary surrender the license. Um, so those cases are going to be closed. And uh, the only outstanding SOA case I have is a license denial case um, that will be filed um, either today or early next week. Uh, so the agreed order and executive director execution of the orders uh, processes very efficient in moving these cases forward. All right. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Andrew. All right. And Patrick, you didn't have anything on that at all? Um, so, okay. All right. So number five, agenda item number five, uh, report of agreed orders executed by the council's executive director. That was in your meeting materials. Um, be happy to try to answer any questions that you might've had on those cases. Anybody have any, any questions on those that were included? Seeing no hands or nobody, we'll accept those as submitted. And we'll move to agenda item number six, report of cases dismissed by the council's executive director. Those are- And that report was in your meeting materials. Yeah. 
I'll be happy to answer any questions. No questions? All right. We will move to seven. Status report of quarterly enforcement case activities. That report was in your meeting materials. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We don't typically share that screen, do we? That's the status report. The status. I can share that one. Yeah, we can just. I'm, I'm asking Sarah just to share that screen just briefly so the public can see the, the hard work that they do go through and um, see some of the numbers that that we do deal with. So um, it's got basically a year's worth of information there. Uh, we're really highlighting the fourth quarter, which which ended August 31st. But as you can see, they were able to resolve 226 cases. Um, during that time period. Um, Oops, what happened? Oh, there it is. Oh, but you went somewhere else. Okay. There you are. So just just so everybody can take note and, um, and understand, we do have, um, so if you look at the very top box, number of pending complaints, you can look over to the right. That 467 is not social work. But if you go down to where the TSB SWE, we have 169 of those. So that's our that's our outstanding. Um, and then uh, we have 19 under sexual misconduct. Uh, we have three cases concerning applicants, and then the rest of it is just just data for for information. So just just to show y'all the the work that go that the that the staff do more than just review licenses here. They do deal with complaints on a regular basis. So thank you all for that. Andrew's got a point to make. I mean, Patrick does. I'm looking at Andrew, he's got his hand up. Oh, I, I was gonna say, Sarah, when you had that up, I was gonna ask you to scroll down the uh, the three cases that Mr. Hurt was talking about uh, is th are there on 2016. So if you scroll down, those those that number three is now a zero. Uh, and okay. so that'll so it's zeros in 15, 16, and 18. So um, we just have four and 17 and four, three and 19, and then it goes to the 2020s and 40s. So there, the old cases are slowly being weeded out. Yeah. And, and, and I want to give a thank you to the board members that, that do hear these, these cases on a, on a regular basis. I know uh, Asia and I have one, I guess, I think it's next week with, with Andrew, um, not the SOA cases, but the ones that are for, for up just for consideration. So just so that the public understands the process, it's not just one person making a decision here. It is a, it is a team based process. So, all right. Thanks for that, Sarah. Okay. Um, all right, now I got to get back to where I was. Um, <laughs> So we're on agenda item number eight, which is report of compliance with agreed orders. That report was in your meeting materials. It is a confidential report, so I can't display it, but I can try to answer any questions you might have. And I, I don't have any. I've looked it over. Anybody have any questions? No? All okay. right. Thank we'll you. move to number nine, discussion and possible action to reelect or replace professional member delegate to the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council for Texas Occupations Code 507.501 Executive Council membership, Brian Brumley, LMSW IPR, whose term as delegate expires February 1, 2023, per Title 22 of the Texas Administrative Code 881.4 Council member terms. So, all that to say this, my, my term as a professional member from this board to the larger VHIC board is coming up. And um, I will I will say I don't mind remaining on that. And but if y'all would rather someone else be in that place, uh, it is now open for consideration. I make a motion to reelect. 
I second. All right, we have a motion by Ben and a second by Audrey to for me to remain uh, in the position. All those in favor, signify by saying yes or raising your hand. I, I can't vote. Yes. Yes. Any any no's? Hearing none, seeing none. I will remain. All right. Thank y'all for that and for your trust in me in doing that. Thank you. Um. So agenda item ten: discussion and possible action concerning posting of board guidelines for using social media and board's guidelines for electronic practice on the board's forms and publications webpage. So that's in there too somewhere. Would you like to see one of those? Sure. So what we've got, and, and, and this again is a draft, um, and, and it is guidelines. This is not this is not in the form of a rule. This is more like here's how you should act. Um, so it's it's a um, the, the first one is electronic practice, and it just gives you basic information about how to to provide um, remote services in, in any sort of electronic practice that you set up. So again, it is guidelines that it is based in rule, but this in and of itself is not specifically a rule. So it is a guideline. So it is there and and so we we take action on both of these today to vote because they are a draft. These will now, if we approve these, they will be published on our website. That's correct. Yeah. So um, or any other action you deem appropriate. Yes, yes. So we have we have the one on electronic practice, and then the other one was on social media, I think. Yeah, and guidelines for using social media. Um, they're 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 both again guidelines. So um, we have two: the electronic practice and social media. I will take a motion to accept these for publication to the website. Stop my share so we can see people. Okay. So does anybody before before I take a motion, does anybody have any questions about this? Any of the board members? None. Y'all have had opportunity to review them and read over them. So um, taking, I will now entertain a, a motion. I'll make a motion um, to post them to the website. Okay. A second. So we have a motion by Martha and a second by Jennifer um, to post both the electronic practice and social media guidelines to the um, Texas State Board of Social Work Examiners website. Uh, so we'll have a vote. All those in favor, raise your right hand or signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, hearing none, the motion does carry. So they will be published. Um, I don't know a time frame. Do you, Sarah, how long it takes? Next couple of days. I'll do it. Oh, all right. She'll get it up there by hopefully middle of next week, she said. And you'll be notified by, if you subscribe to email updates, uh, for those that are in attendance, you'll be notified by email update. Board members, I will send you an email when it's posted. Okay. So that moves us to agenda item number 11, report from committee chairs. So we do have four, four specific committees on the board. Um, I will take the first one, report from the ethics committee chair, which is which I do chair. Um, nothing really to, to report back there other than um, we are hearing cases via Zoom with the attorneys and with the parties and sometimes their attorneys. And that seems to be working. It's a little quirky sometimes, but but it's um, I think saving the time of the um, the folks who are not having to come to Austin and, and do all that. So that seems to be working well. So next we'll have a report from licensure and standards and qualifications committee. Ms. Mosier, Martha, do you have anything to report out? I do not. We have not had a meeting. Okay. So then um, report out from professional development, which I also chair, and I don't have anything to report out from that committee either. 
I could report that um, as chair of that committee, you approved uh, changes to the jurisprudence exam that became effective oh, right. for rules that became effective September 21st. Those um, rules, those question changes were sent to the vendor and the vendor reported that those uh, changes had been updated on October 4th. So anyone taking the jurisprudence exam after October, uh, after that time on October 4th will now have all of their questions up to date um, with our current rules. Okay. And then uh, a report out from the rules committee uh, from Ms. Mosier, anything there? Yes, uh, the rules committee, we did meet on August 19th um, and we had several things that this board will now be considering for the full board uh, consideration. So we did discuss a possible rule change and kind of reorganization uh, related to the LMSW scope of practice and conditions of supervised experience. So we have referred that in 2023, there will be a full review if I understand all this correctly. So y'all, Sarah and Patrick um, and Andrew, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but in 2023, there will be a full review of our rules. And so we've recommended this be considered at that time because it's kind of a big um, area to undertake and, and look at that and cross all of the rules and statutes. So for right now, nothing is, is nothing will be considered under the rules committee or with this board until that review has occurred. And then um, we did recommend rule changes um, with related to 781.401 qualifications for licensure and 781.404, which is recognition as a council approved supervisor in the supervision process. Those are on this agenda under 12A and 12B um, that we'll talk further about as we move through the agenda. And then we did recommend um, a new 781.421. Um, that was a remedy for incomplete license requirements to provide some flexibility in the event of disasters uh, for people to be able to move more smoothly uh, through the licensing process. And I believe that, yes, that is on our agenda for further consideration for y'all to see what those recommendations are momentarily. And I think, Sarah, did I leave anything out, out from our meeting? Nope. Uh, okay. Not at all. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you, ma'am. So, um, Sarah, Patrick, if, if I have a um, suggestion to make to the rules committee for a future meeting, would I do it here in the agenda or during my report in the agenda? Or in the future activities. Let's do it in future the... activities. Okay. okay. We'll do it there. So. All right. So that does complete uh, the report from committee chairs for everybody. And we will move to uh, agenda item number 12, which just rolls into what Ms. Moser just talked about, which is discussion of possible action concerning potential changes to Title 22 of the Texas Administrative Code as recommended by the Rules Committee on August 19th, 2022. So A is qualifications for licensure 701-404, recognition as a council approved supervisor and the supervising process to ease supervised experience requirements such as an that an applicant's qualified experience, supervised experience for LCSW may exceed 48 months and for independent practice recognition may exceed 60 months or five years. And then we have B781.421, remedy for incomplete license requirements to allow the board to make exceptions for applicants that have difficulty fulfilling certain licensure, licensing requirements due to a declared disaster. For example, some social workers have expressed difficulty in meeting the required supervised experience hours due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So those are the two items that Martha spoke about from, from her committee, the Rules Committee, and they are now uh, before us for a vote to move forward uh, with that. So it is a recommendation from the committee that they be submitted as 12 A and B. So I will accept a motion from the board uh, to accept both 12 A and B uh, as they are described. I make a motion to accept changes A and B as described. 
Okay. I'll second. Okay, I don't know. Some, I think that was Martha who I heard. So Audrey made the motion. I got a second from Martha. So all those in favor of changing 12, uh, agenda item 12A and B as proposed in the agenda, please signify by raising your hand or saying aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, seeing none, we will now move to agenda item 13. Discussion and possible action regarding rules committee's request for board approval to informally gather stakeholder input concerning crisis intervention experience and related continuing education. So Martha, do you wanna talk about that? Yes, I can. So um, we had a lot of um, information research and in light of kind of some of the recent um, events that occurred across our nation to consider requiring crisis intervention as part of the mandatory CEU requirements for licensure renewal. Um, and so in the rules committee, we had a discussion that, you know, we don't really know, at, you know, with social work, there is such a wide range of practices that are out there. And so we would really like to hear from stakeholders in terms of their feelings around this before we just move forward with an action in terms of should it be there, um, how, how many hours of CEUs um, should be there. And when you mention crisis intervention, that can be a, a lot of different interpretations of what that means. Um, so we had wanted Sarah to kind of reach out and post something that would garner some of that stakeholder feedback and comments for us to consider. Okay. okay. So what could be the plan for that to happen, Sarah? We just put it out on our website that we take input? So or? if you approve the draft today, mm -hmm. then yes, I would work toward building a survey instrument and um, a posting on our website that would link to the survey instrument and then the survey instrument would gather that material back. Um, we'd set a particular deadline for the closing of the survey and, and then come back to um, the rules committee with the results of that survey for any recommendations the rules committee might make to the board. Okay. Um, so board members in your packet agenda, I think it's 13, right? Agenda item 13, you have, you have some information related to that, that, that hopefully you've had opportunity to review um, as far as this agenda item topic. So, um, we're, we're asked to approve the draft process that we have here to allow Sarah to move forward with the, the plan to uh, receive input on this topic. So that's coming from the Rules Committee from their August 19th or 9th. I don't remember what day, whatever. But the, the, their August 19th, I think, meeting. Um, so we'll move forward with uh, taking a motion to accept this draft. I make a motion to accept the draft. Okay, so we have a motion from Jennifer and a second from Dolores. That's, yes. that's okay. And uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand, say aye. So agenda item 13 is approved and we will um, ask that this be um, moved forward as reported. Okay. Agenda item 14, discussion and possible action related to staff recommendation for changes to 22 Texas Administrative Code 781-501 requirements for continuing education to expand the list of providers from which licensees must obtain at least 50% of their continuing education hours to include a hospital or hospital system, including any clinic, division, or department within a hospital or hospital system. And to add the effective and to add effective date for subsection F as January 1, 2024. Is that correct? 2024? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's um, in your in your packet as well. So if you had opportunity to review that, so so this is not at all saying, when I first read this and looked at it, I thought it was saying we had to get it from a hospital, but it is not at all. It's saying that hospitals are now included in the overall provider list. Is that basically the? In the list of 
providers from which the licensee must get at least 50 percent right of yes their stuff. of their stuff yes <laughs> yeah but it's not saying it that they have to go they the hospital they don't have 50 percent doesn't have to come from a hospital that's correct yeah that hospitals are included in the list so attorney patrick you want to explain oh sure um and the other part of it to make the effective date in in as this has gone through the process of going through with the other boards, something that I believe that came up with the LPC board was making it an effective date because subsection F is essentially going to be the one that's going to be the kind of the change that's not necessarily something that is that well technically it's a it's it's the rule now because we did change it, but um, it might be the part that that people may not have in the past been been following and so we wanted to put a future effective date to make it fair and easy for people to comply so they don't get caught off guard. And so that's why we we just picked a date in the future as January 1st, 2024, so that it's not, the people have plenty of notice with the two-year renewal cycles of when it, when, so that they're able to comply with this. And, and speaking with, with uh, I think it was the LPC board uh, and, and some of the comments received, a lot of the idea behind subsection F is you're looking at larger organizations where there's a certain amount of vetting and, and uh, they have sort of a system to create sort of good uh, continuing education programs and a hospital, a hospital system sort of fell in line with the general framework that's already in sort of F. So we thought it would be worth to add them as somebody that, you know, could be included in that, that 50% uh, part of the rule. And, and Patrick, this also falls in line with some of the standardization stuff that's going on over at BHEC, right? Correct, correct. And these these changes are being brought up with all the other boards as well. Right. So that means LPC counseling, psychology, and LMFT, along with us, is looking at trying to <clears throat> standardize rules so that there's not all these differences out there, as it the can be. Yeah, correct. And so this 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 uh, proposal will be brought up with. I think it will be in the LPC one when they when they look at it, and uh, it's going to be brought up with MFT. And I imagine it. Uh, Psychology has one out already, but it'll probably be brought back up with them as well. So it'll be something that we're trying to standardize with all the other boards. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. So. So having heard from uh, Attorney Patrick, um, I would entertain a motion uh, concerning agenda item number 14. I'll make the motion to uh, approve item number 14 with the requirements for continuing education to hospital systems. I'll second it. So I have a motion from Martha and a second from Audrey. Uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your hand or saying aye. aye. So it does pass. Any opposed? Hearing none, seeing none. Agenda item 14 does pass. So agenda item 14, discussion and possible action concerning public comment on the proposed rule published in the August 5th, 2022 Texas Register 47, Texas Reg 4614 of this proposed rule, as well as recommendations to the uh, Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council <laughs> Council concerning adoption of proposed changes in uh, Chapter 22 of the Texas Administrative Code, A, 781-304, relationships with clients to remove uh, duplicative language that is currently stated in 781.310 pertaining to billing and financial relationships. Um, 781-401, qualifications for licensure to remove the requirements that supervised experience must be obtained within five years immediately preceding the date of application for specialty recognition. C, 781-405, application for licensure to correct a typographical area, error, error. D, 781-406, required documentation of qualifications for licensure to remove the requirement that supervised experience must be obtained within five years immediately preceding the date of application for LCSW. E, <coughs> excuse me, 781-803, severity levels, to make the rule clearer and simplifying the guide but combining levels two and three into a supervision for any amount of time. 
Additionally, the maximum penalty for amount for each level is raised to $5,000 to align with the occupation code section 507.352. And F 781.805 schedule of sanctions to replace the current schedule of sanctions and make it easier to use and align with amendments 781.303. So these have been published in the register <coughs> and Public comment, Sarah, any any report back on that? Public comment was received for 781.401 and for 781.406. And those specific comments were included in your packet. Yes. And those were both dealing with the five-year rule, right? The 401 and 406. 401 was um, uh, removed. I thought those were already removed for 401. But that's what I've got written down. Yeah, that's what's here. I don't know what's in my. So here's the rule. Yeah, that's the five-year thing. So it looks like we had two comments on that. Oh, I think. Um, or that's what we had in our. Is this the, Yeah, so the the clinical supervision was already removed from this rule. This this um, this uh, publication was removing it from the independent practice recognition. Um, the process for independent practice recognition also has a clause, as you can see here on my screen, um, that supervised experience also must have incurred within five cal calendar years immediately preceding the date of the application for the independent practice recognition specialty. Yeah. So that was a different provision than the one that was previously removed from 401 about clinical supervision for LCSW. Yes. So that that's it just so, signifies specialty recognition, which is the IPR. So the yeah. 401 is about the independent practice recognition and the 406 is about yeah. The remaining provision for um, five years before the application for LCSW. Okay. So hearing that, I would. Uh, so we do take action on these, even though they have been published. So we 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 would take action to approve A through F of agenda item number fifteen. If I could have a motion. So are we approving these or this is just a review of the public comment? Well, it it's says a, it's action. A, it's a review of public comment. Any discussion you might want to have about the public comment. Uh, um, when when the adopted rules are, if, if you recommend adoption and if the council agrees with the adoption, the adoption rules are published. And okay. in the preamble with the adopted rules is a response from the board on the public comment that was received. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, Attorney Patrick. So if you have any response to the comment, now would be the time to express it to Attorney Patrick for that okay. purpose. Okay. Co correct. And this is making a, a recommendation to adopt to, by the making a recommendation to the council to adopt these. So we would we would need a formal action from the board recommending adoption of these rules, rule proposed rule changes. And okay. then the council will take it up on the 25th. Okay. So, and I know the public comments that we did receive were in support um, mm -hmm. of these rules. Um, so I will make a motion to recommend these to the council for adoption. So are you recommending all of them, Martha? Yes, I am. Okay. So we have a motion by Martha. I need a second. A second. Have a second by Dolores. All those in favor of approving um, agenda item 15A through F. Signify by raising your hand or saying, ah, uh, any opposed? 
hearing none, seeing none, we will move forward with approval of agenda item 15. Um, 16, agenda item, discussion and possible action regarding jurisprudence exam. So we know it's been updated as of October 4th. So that was earlier this week, wasn't it? Yeah. And in your, in your packet is a report from the vendor and include uh, examinees comments and um, uh, their data. I, I didn't find anything remarkable on that report, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any questions. Um, we've already discussed changes to the jurisprudence exam um, in regard to updating rules for um, updating the exam to reflect most recently effective rules. Um, and staff asked that the board consider um, the timed function, the timer inside the rule. So currently when an, when an examinee is taking the exam, the question, is displayed and they they cannot complete their answer for 25 seconds. Um, my understanding, I was taught that this was put in place so that the examinee didn't just click through the, all the possible answers and just whip through the exam without really reading the material. Um, uh, and, and in the discussions, um, I believe with the standardization committee and with staff, um, staff had asked the board to consider that. I did note that the vendor, um, we have a, a large pool of questions and the vendor pulls 126 questions from that random pool for a particular exam. And I multiplied 126 by about 25 seconds and we get 52.5 minutes for just sitting through the exam. The current CE rules, give um, allow a licensee to claim one hour of credit for completing the jurisprudence exam. Now they might take a little bit longer because there's some, you know, what type of license do you hold or are you a student or some of those questions are part of part of a survey that's included in the exam. So it might take them a few minutes longer than 60 minutes to actually complete it. Um, or if they're having to read through the statute to find the answer, that might take them longer as well. But the timer on there makes it at, at least 52 and a half minutes long. So what do you if we if we took the timer off, we would ethically, I think, need to remove the um, awarding of CEs, right? I mean, because we wouldn't have any way to know how long somebody spent in there. And the, and the vendor has, has uh, advised me that they currently don't have the capability to see a particular person's start and stop time on the exam. And a person can start the exam, shut it down, walk away from it, do a session or two, come back a day or two later. And, and so they really don't have a, a way to say how many, how, what the duration is for a particular examinee so they couldn't give me an average time or a median time for that it takes that it takes yeah. all i can all i can surmise is the minimum based time. on the time yeah. yeah we get a minimum so patrick has something to say yeah i definitely didn't want to suggest to to get rid of any uh ce credit for it because that was something part of the standardization committee I had looked at and everybody's sort of gone with giving a one hour of CE uh, credit for taking the jurisprudence exam. Okay. Um, I they, they didn't hire me for my math skills, so I, I was under the impression that it took it. They were required to sit in front of the computer longer than an hour when taking the jurisprudence exam. So I don't. I trust Sarah's math more than mine, uh, uh, and may have gotten that wrong. And t Tim, if you if your math is better than mine, you may chime in, but I thought they had to sit in front of the computer for more than an hour. So that's why we staff were saying it didn't seem fair to only award an hour when we made them sit in front of a computer and take a test that they couldn't complete. They they, they had to spend more than an hour to complete. So, but if my math is wrong, again, don't, don't trust my math. Go with Sarah or Tim's math over mine. Well, if I just use simple 30 seconds a question and 126 questions 
divide it by two, that's about 60 minutes. So yeah. a little over. And, so, and the, yeah. the piece of information that I didn't have when staff was discussing this was how many questions were pulled for a particular exam. And the only information I had at my fingertips was how many total were there. Pool. Yeah. We're in the pool for 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 plucking. So any thoughts or input yeah. anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Is that Tim talking? I don't know. <laughs> is this microphone turned on? Someone someone's microphone is turned on, but yeah, not and I don't I don't think they're gonna whose image I see. Oh, there it is. That might be Tim. Credit for it. But I'll I'll chime in. I think it's Tim. And Tim, I think you need to may restate what you were saying because nobody heard you. Or maybe he was talking to somebody else and his mic was just on. I'll go check, Sarah. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, I was uh, I was on the phone. Daryl had just called, asked me to uh, chime in with a little reminder. Originally, the uh, JP exam counted for three hours of continuing education. And so that's why the timer was put on there was to make sure that people were uh, staying on there long enough. Um, I don't believe the other programs have a timer on their uh, questions. And they so count. they also get credit for the JP exam without the timer. So you don't have to have the timer on there to be able to give credit for the JP exam. Okay. Well, then hearing that. We have two board members out of camera. Oh, we do. But we still have a, we still have a quorum. Two, three, four, five, six. Oh, Ms. Romsbacher's back. back. Okay. Okay. So um, hearing that, I would take um, in, in, any discussion on 16C um, regarding removing the timed function. I know it has always been the majority of the complaints on the public comment about having to sit there and do nothing for 25 seconds. So uh, any, any, Correct. yeah. And since LPC, LMFT and psychology do not have the timed function and we're looking at standardization, I don't, I don't have any qualms against moving that way. If anybody wants to make a motion in that sense. I'll make a motion to remove that timed function. It seems to make second. Sense. Okay, so I have a motion from Martha and a second from Dolores. Dolores, yeah. So all those in favor, signify by saying aye, raising your hand. Any opposed of removing the timed function? Hearing none, seeing none, the motion does carry and pass. Okay, so we will move to agenda item number 17. Uh, which is my report concerning current challenges, accomplishments, lawsuits, interaction with stakeholders, state officials and staff, committee appointments and functions, workload of the board members, conferences, general information regarding the routine functioning of the board. Um, I know we will have um, public comment later. I'm sure you're all aware of the ASWB data analysis that was released um, a couple months ago. Um, I will be attending um, the delegate assembly in November, uh, where that will be the topic of discussion. Um, also serving on uh, a committee with ASWB, the uh, Regulatory Education and Leadership Committee, which is looking at uh, how data is used, obtained with ASWB to create um, the exam in its current state. So there's, there's, there's lots of opinions, lots of discussion about that out there right now. Um, we as a board uh, do not have anything on the agenda today about that other than public comment. So uh, there's, there's my input about the uh, data analysis from ASWB. Um, the NASW conference is next week uh, in Galveston. I know Sarah's attending, I'll be attending as well. 
So anybody who wants to come by and have a discussion will be somewhere you can find us. Um, don't know how much we'll be able to talk to you, but we'll be happy to meet with you and, and listen at, and do our best to help with any information that you need about um, seeing us face to face, talk about CEU changes, talk about rule changes, anything that, that you want to discuss with us. Um, I have a session. Okay. Um, and I also will be at in the exhibitors hall at a table. So you can always find me if I'm not presenting the session, you can find me at the exhibitors hall. And I'll spend some time at the table with Sarah and then my university also will have a table and a booth there. So I'll be, oh, I'll be back and forth in, in and around. So uh, try to be as visible as possible and, and open to any conversation. So that's really, um, really all I have, I guess, you, I mean, you're all aware now that the BHEC meeting is October 25th. We've, we've, <laughs> ridden that horse to the ground today so um, it is also one you can join by zoom and 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 pay attention to if you want to participate in that all right so now we'll uh, that and that's all i have on agenda item eight at uh, 17 so we'll move to 18 report from the board's delegates to the texas behavioral health executive council regarding the activities of the executive council including a the, a, the council published proposed rules in the August 5th, 2023 register, 47 Texas Reg 4632, affecting uh, Texas Administrative Code 22, 885.1, executive council fees. To act on October 8th, 2019, letter from Governor Abbott instructing agencies to reduce licensure application fees to 75% or less of the national average for equivalent or comparable occupations whenever possible. B, the council's rulemaking actions taking at its October, August 23rd, 2022 meeting, and then other council updates. So I serve on that as well as Ms. Rogers. Um, uh, nothing really to report out other than, than the information is there um, as presented. Ms. Rogers, do you have any, any input from, from the meeting that we had? No, nothing, nothing to report. Okay, nothing to report out there. There's a summary in your packet. It's also in the public attendees packet, mm -hmm. including um, the uh, 885.1 uh, executive council fees rule and uh, the actions taken on August 23rd, as well as uh, the council's travel policy. So that should be in your meeting materials if you have any questions about that. So any board members have any questions about agenda item 18? None, all right. We'll move to 19. Report from the board administrator concerning operations, organization and staffing, workload processing and statistical information, status of rulemaking, customer service accomplishments, inquiries and challenges, media, legislative and stakeholder contacts and concerns, special projects and general information regarding the routine functioning of the program. So thank you. I'll start with um, information on ASWB's release of their exam data um, in their, I believe it was August 30th um, release from their CEO. They included a number of ways that um, they can, that you can participate in, um, in what they call continuing the conversation. They have a community input session, so you can volunteer to participate in that. They, they've established a um, email address, exam at aswb.org, where you can send a question or a comment about the, about the exam, as well as a, a share your thoughts link. Um, again, this is in your board materials and the links are live, so that you should be able to just click on that and get to the ASWB section. Um, there's information on their website about um, ASWB measures. Um, in their exam, uh, how, their, how their exam measures competence and um, how they're now currently working for the next exam. Um, they take a survey of the social work workforce. Um, and there's, uh, on that link, you can, you can participate in that survey and then make sure that your type of practice or that your particular concerns will be included in that survey of the workforce. 
Um, and then they also offer uh, free resources for the exam for social work educators. If you're uh, a social work educator in your school uh, would like to uh, review and perhaps enhance the performance of your graduates, then this might be a good resource for you to consider. Uh, we did receive a number of comments after the August 5th release of the exam data. Those were included in the board members' materials. As is usual when written public comment is received, uh, it's provided to the board members, but it, it is not read aloud in this meeting, just um, that's our, our, our policies, but the board members have reviewed that. Um, it's also been shared with ASWB because ASW, as a member of the association, this board was asked to share any feedback that we received. Um, let's see. Update on the social work compact. The language is out there for review. Um, uh, so there's, uh, you, you can comment, stakeholders can comment on the language. The next step is for the uh, compact folks to revisit the language and make any, just like we do with our rules, they get comp public comment and then they make an adjustment to the rules uh, before they then present that to the state legislators. So it would have to be the Texas legislature to review that a, a bill and enact that bill into law for Texas to participate in the compact. And then a certain number of states have to do that process and enact the compact into law for the compact to take effect. Um, so there's a ways to go on it, but it is progressing. Um, so just wanted to update you on the update you on that. I think that's that's all for my report. Um, oh, I do want to thank Brenda Skiff and any staff that may have assisted her. The uh, statute on our statute and rules webpage. The rule, rule books were updated September 28th. We did send out an email message to those who subscribe to email updates. So if you'd like to get those kind of messages, please visit our webpage uh, on the right hand side <laughs> for the, thank you, Ms. Skip, for uh, email updates and follow that subscription form and get subscribed to that so that you're informed about that. And I think that's all for my report, unless you have any particular questions. Anybody have any questions? I just want to thank Sarah for putting that information together. I know it's a lot. You're quite welcome. Thank you. All right. So we'll move to agenda item number 20, which is discussion and possible action regarding future priorities and activities of the board. Um, anybody have anything they want to talk about or discuss? You wanted an item I for the yeah, I, I do have one. Um, so Martha, I'd like for um, your group, the Rules Committee, to look at um, Board Rule 781-404-A2. Uh, it, it states in that rule, clinical supervision of a licensed master social worker in a setting in which the LMSW is providing clinical services, the supervision may be provided by a licensed professional counselor, licensed psychologist, licensed marriage and family therapist, or licensed clinical social worker or psychiatrist. The supervision is not related to qualification for licensure. Or this supervision is not related to qualification for licensure, practice specialty, um, a disciplinary order, or a condition of new or continued licensure. So, um, oh, that's not it. 781 404. Did I say it? Did I do it wrong? Did you say 404? 781 404. This is a, why we want to reorganize them. I think this is what you wanted. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. So that's the, the supervision. So, and Patrick, you may can chime in here. That, that last sentence there. This supervision is not related to qualification for licensure, practice specialty, a disciplinary order, or condition of continued license. So I've had folks reach out to me and, and, and say this might be a little confusing because 
in one sense, it looks like that someone who is under clinical supervision can have someone from one of the other boards supervise them. But then you get to the last sentence and it said it is not related to a qualification for licensure. So what exactly does this mean? My understanding is that if I'm an LMSW, if I have a master's license, uh -huh. I can work for an agency providing clinical services as long as the oversight of my work is done by an LPC, a psychologist, an LMFT, an LCSW, or a psychiatrist. But none of those hours would count toward my supervised experience for clinic toward an LCSW license. Okay. Section subsection three or subparagraph three. If I want to qualify for a clinical license as a master social worker, I have to be under a clinical supervision with an LCSW, a, a licensed clinical social worker who has supervisor status. And I have to then be providing that clinical services under that members. clinical supervision plan. So if I'm a master social worker and I'm not looking to gain the clinical social work license down the road, I want my career to be just master's category, then I can provide clinical services as long as I'm employed by an agency or under contract with an agency, not in my own private practice, but I have to be, I, I use oversight instead of supervised because it's confusing, Yes. but my work has to be overseen um, with, by one of these other professionals. Um, and, and in another rule, it talks about the, the responsibility for the welfare of the client cannot be my own entity or my own agency. It has to be an agency for which I am employed or, or have a contract with. Right. And that's, that, that is my understanding as well, Sarah. And that's how I've always interpreted that. Um, However, I think some of this could be more clearly stated. And if yeah. I'm recalling correctly, in our August 19th meeting, this language about LMSW, the supervision scope of practice, whether they can be contract or whether they have to be employed by agencies, that is what we recommended um, be included in that 2023 uh, review. Okay. So maybe better clarify all of this for an LMSW and what settings and what supervisions they're under. All right. Thank you, Martha. That's that, that was just my question there. That's, I wanted to see if we could get that cleaned up some, because it right. does. I agree with you. Yeah. It does leave a little room for confusion with the right. word supervision in there. To me, it does anyway. Right. And then there are other parts of those rules and statutes that kind of sort of say the same things, but maybe a little differently. So for that language to get very consistent across here was our recommendation out of the August 19th meeting. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for your work on that. So, and, and Patrick, do you have opportunity to talk here about what that 2023 review is? Is that something that you guys are doing internally or is that with all four of the sub boards? Yeah. So Every agency is required to do a rule review. And I forget, I think I want to say it's every four years, but I'd have to double check that. And so you have to review all your rules, make sure that they're valid. And, and it's a good time to do cleanup to make things sort of clearer. Okay. And so a lot of this sounded like, um, you know, personally, 781.404 is a really long rule. And it would be something that I think would be clearer if it was maybe broken up into multiple rules. Um, so that a rule review would be a great opportunity to do that, where you basically what you're saying is take a rule, the existing rule, but make, try to make it clear, structure it so that, um, you know, you parse it out a little bit easier so that people can understand it. And, um, uh, that's one of the functions of a rule review. And so it might be good for that as well as other rules, because okay. some of these standards, are in other rules as well. And that's what would make it difficult is if we changed what's in 781.404, we may need to look at, I think 40, uh, no, it's 301, I think as well, that talks about some of the roles of the different level, the different, the master's level or clinical level social worker. So 
um, rule review opens up all those rules. And so that's part of the issue is we can fix this, but then it might cause problems with other rules. And so rule review, you have to look at all the rules and you have to basically certify they're all still good, valid, you know, valid rules. So, okay. All Mr. Right. Spear had his hand raised for okay. a second. Do you have a comment, Mr. Spear? No, Patrick uh, covered it. Thank you. All right. Well, that was that was all I had. Anybody have anything else about uh, discussion and possible action regarding future priorities? Anybody have any input for future committees? All right. Seeing none, hearing none, we will now move to agenda item 21, which is public comment. So just to uh, get everyone on the same page, what I'll first, we have no one here in person. Um, so I will look to those who have logged into the computer. Um, uh, if you'd like to make public comment, please use the raise hand feature to identify yourself. Um, after I've gone through the list of those who have raised their hands and logged in by computer, I will access those who have logged in by, who have called in, um, and I will ask them if they have public comment. Please uh, remember the public comment is limited to three minutes. We ask that you identify whether you are making a comment uh, on behalf of yourself as an individual or whether you represent an organization or an agency, and you're making a statement on that organization or agency's behalf. Um, please note that public comment is not intended for a discussion or a question and answer session with the board members. Um, the board members may certainly ask that a public comment issue be added to a future agenda, either during this meeting or after this meeting by sending me an email or some future date. Um, but this session is not, this is not intended to be a back and forth session with the board members. Additionally, when making a public comment, um, please refrain from uh, asking or making a comment about a particular complaint case or a particular application. Um, sometimes there's confidential information in that, and we uh, don't want to broadcast that to uh, all of the public that are attending. So with that, I will look at the attendee list and see who has raised a hand. And I see uh, Mr. Francis of NASW Texas. You have public comment. Uh, thank you. My name is Will Francis, and I'm the executive director of the National Association of Social Workers Texas chapter. I'd like to thank the board for their work supporting the profession. But I will share that NASW Texas was disappointed to see that the recent release of data from ASWB indicating disparities in the pass rates and licensing exams was not set as a separate agenda item for discussion by this board, and that no board member suggested it under item 20 as a future priority of the board. Our chapter released a draft report assessing the Texas data, which we will share with board members and the public. The findings in this report counter chapter 505 of the Texas Occupations Code, the social work statute, which states that the exam must be fair and impartial. This board has an obligation to not only protect the public, but to utilize their power in regulating the profession to ensure that the laws that shape social work are being enforced. The data shows discrepancies around age, gender, and primary language, but I would like to explicitly highlight the disparities in race and ethnicity regarding the eventual pass rate in the master's and bachelor's tests. In Texas, 83% of all test takers eventually pass the master's exam but 94% of white applicants pass, while only 64% of black applicants pass. The bachelor's results are even more shocking. 68% of all test takers eventually pass this exam, which is actually well below the national average of 81%, but 85% of white applicants pass, which is over the national average, while only 48% of black applicants pass. This data is not indicative of an impartial test, and should not be interpreted as a sign that any group of people is less able to practice social work. Rather, the, social, the Texas examinations are a red line preventing diversity in our profession. The board and stakeholders must act now. And ASW Texas is recommending that the board place a moratorium on all bachelor's and master's examinations until ASWB can provide evidence that the test is fair and impartial for Texas test takers. Barring an immediate moratorium, the board should instruct BHEC to charge a one-time fee for taking the test at every level, including clinical, even if people need multiple tenants to pass it. 
The board should conduct a study into alternate licensure paths outside the examinations, looking into modifying or reviving the AMEC program. Mm -hmm. And persons or groups that charge a fee for test preparation should consider a moratorium on their fees until ASWB can show the tests are fair and impartial. This board cannot sit by while the right. law is likely minutes. being broken. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Francis, thank you. Um, next one is David Marston. Mr. Marston, yes. you have public comment? Yes, I do. And, and thank you for your time. And I, I want to say um, as well, I appreciate the work of the board. I think you guys do amazing things. I love how you consider individual circumstances. But I do want to say that I think long term, our board would be smarter to develop rules that we all feel good about, that work in unique situations, and then stand by those rules as opposed to developing rules that we feel like require constant flexibility and constant reinterpretation based on individual circumstances. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Marston. I see no other hands raised, but I do have two callers. Caller, do you have public comment? If you have, there you go. Do you have comment? I, yes, my name is Geraldine Hayes, and I'm actually one of the appellants who is waiting for October uh, 25th. And I'd like to just state that when these, when the changes were made regarding to this five year matter, that um, Rule 781.406, um, it looks like the board did not follow. Rule number 881.1, 881.12. And uh, the record number of denials that I feel like the record number of denials that we are experiencing with this five year rule required the, the board to consider further study of this matter, as the current processes should not cause this, this type of delay. It's been like a year to change and edit a sentence in the rule which is therefore causing uh, continuous concerns with uh, being able to practice uh, as an LCSW. Uh, I, however, I just wanna just make a, a comment to the rule committee. I'm elated to hear that the rule committee uh, is proposing to have a rule mechanism to allow for allowances for uh, social workers impacted by disaster situations. So I'm happy to hear that part. But I really think that the board should consider further study about a record number of denials uh, for persons seeking LCSW. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Caller, you have public comment? Sarah, Sarah this is Daryl. I don't need my three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. I see no other hands raised. So I believe that concludes public comment. All right, thank you, Sarah, for that. So just to speak just a moment about some of the public comment, um, the board is, is, is aware of the ASWB data analysis. Um, we've all received information. We all are working to digest that information. The, the test in and of itself in the state of Texas is currently in statute, meaning it is, it is law basically. So while the board can consider changing the time frame to make those changes is, would be arduous. And I understand y'all want the process started, but we have to have information with which to move forward with. And we are, we are working with um, ASWB. Uh, we have and do recognize the information that, that Mr. Francis talked about. We got that late yesterday um, from them. And, and we are taking all of this into consideration. Um, today, just, just so everybody knows, today is not the only day we can add things to the agenda. We can add things to the agenda up to, is it 30 days before a meeting, Sarah? Or is this yeah, up to 30 days prior to a meeting. Um, our next meeting will be in January. 
the 6th. Is that right? January 6th. Okay. Um, um, hopefully by then we, we will have ha ASWB will have had their delegate assembly, which we will have hopefully further information uh, with which to share and work on. So um, please don't go away today thinking that we're ignoring or we're not recognizing uh, the, the information that has been provided. We're just working to figure out what to do with that information. So, so there was my public comment. I hope it didn't last three minutes. So, um, all right. So now we'll move um, to 22 announcements and comments not requiring action, same as regarding conferences and other recent or upcoming events. Um, as indicated earlier, the, the only thing I'm aware of upcoming is in October is uh, next week, uh, I think Thursday to Saturday in Galveston is NASW. Um, then October 25th, there will be a BHEC meeting. Um, November the 17th, uh, it's, it's like a Friday, Saturday meeting uh, is, I know it starts the 17th, is uh, ASWB. Um, is it the 17th to the 19th? Is that what? Yeah. You, okay. Seven, yeah, because it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it's 17th to the 19th is ASWB's. Um, there's an administrator forum, which Sarah's going to participate in. I'm going to go to the board member exchange, which is also that same day. We're just in different places. And then the actual delegate assembly will be that Friday, Saturday following that. And then further on out in April of next year is the um, education meeting for ASWB. And then our next meeting is indicated is January 6th. So that's that's all I know about conferences and upcoming dates. Anything Sarah, that you need to report out? Nope. Anything from any board members to report out? It, uh, it might be helpful to reiterate to the board and, and to let the public know with that the Texas board is one member of ASWB, the Association of Social Work Boards, and has one vote. And that's what the delegate assembly is for. Like, um, so similar to this board voting on issues and each member has a vote that Texas has one vote in that association. So um, certainly things will be reviewed and discussed and, and then ASWB holds meetings similar to this, just um, uh, where the delegates get to vote on, on next things. There's also a, a board of directors for ASWB. Um, so they have some steerage of the, of the association as well. So you, you might look at their website and see how they are organized um, to understand the mechanisms for that governance of that association. And, and use, the, use the email addresses, use the links that Sarah put in those packets. They're, they're in the public side too. They are. Yeah. yeah, they are. So, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Francis and, and NASW will, will submit their, their document that we got yesterday to, uh, in, to ASWB. Um, and I would encourage them to so that they can see the, the, the outcome as it does impact Texas specifically. Um, we do partner with, with the other states in the United States. Uh, can ASWB also includes the Canadian provinces and the, um, I know Guam and American Samoa, some of the other, I don't think Puerto Rico is part of it, but, but other, other areas. So there's lots of folks. So, um, Please don't go away discouraged today that you think we're not hearing you. We are, and we want to make uh, an informed decision as best we can. Um, so Dolores has a question, her hands up. Oh, yes, ma'am. I, I, it's more of a, also like a comment uh, regarding what you were saying that I think it's also very, very important for um, the statistics, statistics that were shown for people to to contribute and provide information from their own experiences, because if we if they don't hear from them, it's going to be very difficult for them to make any of those changes that that people are looking for. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Dolores, for that. So, um, all right, hearing um, any 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 other board member have anything that we need to talk about today. Anything for future agenda items, anything like that. All right, guys. Well, that moves us to um, to to adjournment. We we I, I am actually here with Sarah today in Austin in the brand new building. My first time here. 
Uh, it's still under construction. I'm going to maybe go check out the lottery division before I leave. They're right next door. So I know where to go now when I win. Uh, so <laughs> we're in the, we're in the, we're, we're in a lucky place maybe. So um, maybe soon we can have a face-to-face -face meeting. I don't know what the, what the plan is for that, but hopefully I'll see y'all in person soon. Other than that, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Make the motion to adjourn. Have that from Martha. I'll second. Second by Ben, and we will, you can adjourn by raising your hand and hitting that leave button, and I'll see y'all in the future. Right, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everybody. Adios. I wonder how bad that was going to be.